Good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you all back uh, for the beginning of the afternoon sessions at our conference on commercial speech and the First Amendment. Um, for this session, however, um, we're going to go overseas. Um, we are going to, to be talking with uh, Remy Chavarn, um, who I will introduce in one second. I am, however, going to give you a, fur a few uh, practical um, pieces of information about the conference at this point. Um, one, you can read about the moderators and panelists in the bio section of our materials. And a link uh, for that is already in the chat box, but we should reappear again shortly and will keep reappearing throughout the day. Um, I want to thank our sponsors um, because I cannot express too much gratitude to them because without them, we can't produce this conference or offer it to you free of cost. Our host, Patterson Belknap, Webb and Tyler, Ballard Spar, Baron, Harris Healy, Davis Wright Tremaine, and Charles Koch Institute. Obviously, I hope you'll stay with us all afternoon. Please feel free to put questions into the Q&A box, which will send them directly to the moderator, or in the case of Remy, our speaker, and our moderators will try to get to the, as many of them as they can. CLE credits being provided by Patterson Belknap under New York and New Jersey rules. If you want CLE credit, you can find the forms on the same website page as the bios and the materials. And now I want to introduce Remy. Remy is a partner with Brinkhoff, a law firm based in Amsterdam that focuses on IP, technology, and communications law, where he heads the EU platforms regulation and litigation team. Remy, over to you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for making me part of your lunch break. Um, I'm excited and honored to be talking to you today amid such a, an awe-inspiring uh, faculty of speakers. And I'm very grateful to the Abrams Institute for the invitation, and in particular to you, Sandy, and your colleagues for all the work that's gone into making this happen. Um, my title is A Heads Up on What EU Influence to Anticipate on the US Internet Law Policy and Practice. Uh, but in keeping with the subject of today's conference, I'm going to focus on the regulation of online advertising, talking briefly about the existing situation, then focusing on what's coming next. Um, I'll occasionally zoom out to look at the EU regulation of online platforms more broadly. And what a time it is to be talking about platform regulation. Um, we have no Donald Trump in Europe, but we do have lots of other presidents. Uh, the tech clash over here is almost as heated, uh, and the basic issues around platform responsibility are quite similar. Should tech companies be doing more, i.e. taking greater responsibility for keeping their platform safe and lawful, uh, for dealing with the next the negative externalities of their success? Should they be doing less, for example, to interfere with their users' speech and or personal data? And commercial speech and political advertising are a core part of that debate. As in the US, the European debate is throwing up a broad range of concerns and demands, which are diffuse and, shall we say, often contradictory, uh, but which are also heated and repeated and so much so that some kind of additional regulation is all but inevitable. A major new EU legislative initiative launched just this morning, and I will get to it. We have 45 minutes, but I don't plan to hold a 45 minute monologue. Uh, that would be exhausting for everyone. And I want to give you the chance to ask questions. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on the Q&A and address any quick points that come up while I'm talking, but I'll try to pause occasionally also to answer questions that have come up. Please feel free to ask. Uh, I want to make this session as practically useful to you all as possible. Now, the idea that there might be such a thing as EU influence on US law policy and practice in the field of digital advertising and platform regulation more generally is based, I think, on two things. Firstly, uh, EU digital rulemaking has a habit of directly or indirectly influencing US policy discussions. Uh, we've seen that in the field of privacy, and the EU is explicitly seeking to promote what it calls its model of a safe and open global internet. Uh, EU initiative in areas such as online content moderation have at least the potential to set some kind of standard. Uh, more practically, more immediately, uh, 
The EU has absolutely no qualms about having its rules apply to non-EU companies which process the data of EU citizens or generate revenue in the EU. And the EU regulations in this field are, to a significant extent, aimed quite squarely at big US tech companies. Uh, it increasingly includes TikTok, but then I suppose TikTok is increasingly becoming uh, American. Some of these regulations were conceived as targeting very specific platforms, although they ended up with definitions that potentially cover a much broader range of services, and we're all kind of wiping up the pieces of that. You still see many uh, US media outlets uh, essentially EU fencing their websites to avoid having to comply with the GDPR, but that's not really an option for most US tech platforms. Once you have you know, major significant uh, uh, commercial interest in the EU, you kind of have to find a way to comply. And it's really no coincidence that a lot of recent decisions from the EU Court of Justice have the names of very big US tech companies in their case titles. So you have, for example, um, Apple on tax and commercial contracts, Amazon on online marketplace liability, consumer protection, Airbnb on real estate regulations, Uber on transport regulations, Google and Facebook on stuff like speech and search and telecom and privacy regulation. So EU regulations are both directly and indirectly relevant to US tech and media companies, and therefore uh, to US tech and media law practitioners and academics. For the same reasons, it helps them know what's coming down the European pike. And the takeaway from my presentation is the road ahead may not always be pretty, but it's going to be busy. So to provide some very rough context, uh, current rules affecting online advertising and advertising platforms, uh, they're spread across a wide range of EU measures. For advertisers, there are directives, for example, on unfair commercial practices and on commercial and misleading advertising. Many EU countries have their own additional laws. They also tend to have self-regulatory codes of conduct um, uh, for advertising, which are sort of formally non-binding, but end up in practice being quite binding because uh, they're basically adhered to quite centrally. Uh, they're very detailed in general um, and quite focused on consumer protection at the expense uh, of commercial interests and some would say the freedom of expression. So if you enjoy watching ads for prescription drugs, uh, you're not going to enjoy Europe. Uh, if you want to run an ad in the Netherlands for an alcoholic beverage that features packaging that depicts a sports activity, well, you can't. Although, thankfully, you can depict sports uh, activities in the ad, but as long as it's there to provide context for the post-activity celebrations. Yes, people actually litigate these provisions. Uh, for broadcasters and video on demand services and their advertisers. The starting point is the audiovisual media services directive that contains a quantitative limits on TV advertising, currently 12 minutes per hour max, although that's being liberalized uh, to 20% per day soon. Uh, the directive prohibits media content that incites hatred and protects children against harmful content. It requires that advertising be recognizable, separate from editorial content, um, and regulates product placement and split screen advertising. It restricts advertising for alcohol and outright prohibits surreptitious advertising, uh, advertising for tobacco and prescription medicines and advertising that causes physical or moral detriment to minors. For online uh, advertising platforms, uh, the starting point is still the electronic commerce directive from 2000. Uh, the broad safe harbor for hosting services is mostly protected ad platforms from liability um, for unlawful ads, but not from injunctions. And those injunctions can order platforms to do all sorts of things, including take down unlawful ads, providing subscriber data, and on occasion, preventing unlawful ads from appearing in future, for example, through various kinds of automated filters. Um, in the online context, especially, privacy rules are an uh, increasingly important part of advertising regulation. The GDPR doesn't actually have any specific rules on micro-targeting, but it does make it a lot more difficult than it is in the US. Uh, you have in the GDPR a broad range of uh, data protection uh, principles, um, such as transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, that kind of stuff. It sets extra strict rules on the processing of sensitive types of data, uh, such as someone's political opinions, health, race, sexual life, etc. cetera. Uh, processing that kind of data is basically prohibited absent specific consent, although there are some very uh, narrow exceptions, for example, for uh, political parties to use personal data of their current or former members 
uh, or people who've been in regular contact with the party. It's all that's all very quite that's quite hard to to apply in, in practice. Um, the relationship between uh, the uh, GDPR and freedom of expression is really not that well defined at all. Um, Article 85 of the GDPR says that member states, and I quote, shall by law reconcile the rights to the protection of personal data pursuant to this regulation with the rights of freedom of expression and information. Uh, but it doesn't actually say how you do that. So good luck with that if you're an EU member state. Um, the GDPR is a very long but still broad horizontal regulation which aims to cover absolutely everything. Um, and though its online draft, sorry, sorry although its, um, its draft has certainly had online marketing in mind, uh, the interface with political speech is entirely uh, undeveloped. And the context for all these EU measures is the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which uh, recognizes and protects several dozen rights, including freedom of expression, but also privacy, data protection, IP, uh, freedom to conduct a business. Yes, that's a fundamental right too. Um, the right to an effective remedy, all sorts of stuff. The basic EU approach is that all fundamental rights are uh, created equal uh, in practice, uh, in principle rather, and that when they collide, um, a fair balance must be found based on the circumstances of the specific case. That sounds kind of nice and obvious in theory, but it's very hard and unpredictable in practice. Uh, in general, um, both political and commercial advertising are protected by the freedom of expression. However, the protection of political advertising is stronger, at least in principle. But then again, uh, political speech is one of those areas where uh, European harmonization is quite limited. There are big differences between different countries. Some countries, for example, outright prohibit paid political advertising on broadcast media, for example, the UK or Ireland or Germany. Uh, these prohibitions generally don't apply to advertising on social media, which is just the case of the, the, you know, the, 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 the legislators not having gotten round to that. Though the costs of those kind of ads can, though, be relevant to, for example, campaign expense restrictions, which quite a lot of countries have in the interest of sort of keeping a level playing field. Uh, other countries regulate political advertising only in the run up to elections, for example, France, uh, and others have absolutely no rules at all. Um, so there's almost no EU level rules on political advertising, with the possible exception of a regulation on privacy compliance by political parties campaigning for the 2019 elections to the European Parliament, a topic so obscure that the EU managed to adopt a regulation without really anyone noticing. Uh, in the run-up to those same elections, uh, platforms such as Facebook and Google and Twitter did sign up to a voluntary EU code of practice on disinformation, where they made a range of commitments on, for example, the scrutiny of ad placements, uh, transparency, political uh, and issue-based advertising, uh, and these platforms have all, as I think we heard this morning, created ad repositories and some sorts of political ad transparency tools. So that's the sort of status quo where we are. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A uh, yet. So that's either a very good or a very bad side, but I'll, I'll keep going uh, and turn to what's coming next. Um, I'll start with three bits of legislation that have already been adopted and will be coming into effect shortly uh, and then move on to rules that are being uh, considered. Uh, rules passed but not yet in force include, first of all, the platform to business regulation or to give it its fancy title, the regulation on promoting fairness and transparency for business users of online intermediation services. We do love our definitions in EU law. Um, this regulation applies from the 12th of July, so six weeks from now, um, and it gives basically businesses that sell goods or services through online platforms some very specific new protections around contractual terms, transparency, access to data, uh, complaint mechanisms. Uh, both platforms and search engines will have to inform businesses about their ranking parameters, and search engines will have to provide some degree of transparency around self-preferment of their own products and services. So this is very much targeting not just sort of Google, but also Amazon uh, and other platforms which sell stuff and include search engines uh, like that. Uh, the regulation is, to be honest, a bit of an over lobbied compromise mess. So it might take a few years to figure out what it actually means, if anything. Uh, but to a US lawmaker figuring out ways to regulate the big platforms, especially around sort of B2B e-commerce issues, uh, that regulation is a logical place to look for inspiration. Secondly, um, a change to the audiovisual media services directive was agreed in late 2018, uh, 
and that has to be implemented in uh, EU member states by the 19th of September of this year. And the most interesting change is that while the directive previously applied only to linear broadcasting and to on-demand services, it's now being extended to so-called video sharing platform services. Again, definition bingo to be played there. Um, those are services featuring a user uploaded video content over which the provider doesn't exercise editorial re responsibility, but which it does organize. Um, so that definition clearly targets YouTube, uh, although how many other platforms it touches uh, will be a key issue uh, going forward. Um, the idea is to create a, a more level playing field in terms of consumer protection uh, between centrally programmed video services such as Netflix and UGC video services such as uh, YouTube. So the new rules um, specifically con concern the protection of minors uh, and certain types of per, per se unlawful content. These rules uh, essentially oblige video sharing platforms to, uh, to take appropriate measures to protect users from uploaded content, included adver including advertising, which is harmful to minors or which contains incitement to violence or to hatred, provocation to commit terrorist offenses, child pornography and offenses concerning racism and xenophobia. Uh, where platforms sell their own ads, uh, those have to comply with the same rules as ads on VOD platforms. But with respect to third party ads, the video sharing uh, platforms have to take appropriate measures to comply with those rules. Um, so the key term there is appropriate measures. How hard do platforms have to work to keep bad ads and other bad content off their platforms? Good question. Uh, the directive makes it clear that these questions, that these measures don't relate to exercising control over the content of third party uploads, uh, but over its organization and presentation. It provides a list of examples such as things like, you know, self certification by uploaders, flagging, rating, reporting tools, parental controls, and very vague stuff like media literacy and uh, awareness uh, programs. Um, it's gonna be really interesting to see how those rules are applied by platforms in practice, uh, and also how they're interpreted by regulators. And that in particular is gonna be the Irish regulator, given that most of the big platforms have their European entities there, and this directive has a uh, uh, home state control mechanism. So the idea is that the Irish regulator is gonna regulate all the European video sharing platform services. There's a lot of room for debate on how broad that definition is of video sharing platform services and how hard the platforms really need to work to keep bad stuff off their platforms. Um, I saw a question from Daphne Keller. Hi Daphne. Uh, since the EU is further down the road towards regulating algorithms, do you see any insights on the nuts and bolts of actually doing that? Uh oh, I see, I sense a no coming. Will the uh, disclosure obligations in the platforms of business uh, regulation lead to meaningful information about massively complex algorithms? And do regulators have the engineering staff to pass it? Uh, really interesting. I think that was a big lobby fight, of course, to water down uh, the, 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 the transparency requirement as much as possible. I think the final language is such that I wouldn't be surprised to see platforms start off by saying very generic things. Uh, that don't require engineers to understand. I'm pretty certain that most uh, regulators don't have the tools or the engineers to pass stuff, but I figure it probably won't be in the first disclosures anyway, actual sort of um, computer science level uh, information. Um, question from Vicky. Um, the AVMS directive targets YouTube and Netflix, but are there any other risks that it might target other platforms that allow users to post videos on their service? Uh, how onerous would those obligations be on those online platforms? Yeah, that, I mean, the definition question is going to be a, a very big one. What exactly is a video sharing platform service? Um, the European Commission is meant to come out with, with some uh, um, uh, guidelines about what the definition means. From based on a leaked draft from last month, they're going to take a pretty maximalist approach. Basically, anything that allows, any service that allows you to upload uh, a video um, might come in scope, but that's going to be quite a fight because that's clearly not the original intent of the of the directive. Um, but I think the the, the the basic approach is that uh, some sort of VOD services programmed centrally, such as Netflix, are going to fall under the existing VOD rules, but those are being slightly uh, increased to slightly more um, level the playing field with broadcasting services. Um, services which are video platform services are going to get this new appropriate measures 
uh, standard and services which do allow some video but aren't video sharing platform services are going to fall under sort of the generic e-commerce directive regulations uh, which are almost you know non-existent they're basically notice and take down they're, they're, the, they're the regulations that the video sharing platforms have been under for the last uh, two decades so that, that's roughly the the three buckets in which um, uh, online video services are going to fall I think whether you're a VOD service or not has always been quite hard and tricky in edge cases and delineating video platform sharing services from non-video sharing platform services is also going to be quite a big fight with lots of uh, territorial turf war uh, going on there. Uh, I think I need to, 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 to move on to the next. Uh, finally, uh, the, the, the last bit of, sort of already made rules that are entering into force at some point in the not too distant future. Um, there's a large scale revision to a bunch of EU directives in the field of consumer protection actually called the consumer omnibus um, that will have to be implemented in national laws by the 22nd of November in 2021 so that's a long way off most of that's actually pretty tangential to online advertising but it does include provisions for example requiring a paid for search results to be clearly identified as such uh, and the extension of a range of transparency rules to online uh, b2c uh, marketplaces uh, there are other pieces of important EU legislation impacting platforms that are currently being transposed into national laws, uh, most notably the Copyright Directive, where there is some pretty crazy stuff going on, uh, and also, slightly less excitingly, the European Electronic Communications Code. Uh, but they're not really related to advertising, at least not directly, so I'm going to leave those uh, for another day. Which brings us to the future legislation. Um, there's no such thing as an executive order in EU law, um, but the legislative machine is very much gearing up. Uh, just this morning, the European Commission, which uh, is basically the civil service uh, in Brussels, which initiates EU legislation, uh, published a consultation on what they call the Digital Services Act. Uh, that initiative looks to revise and expand the Electronic Commerce Directive, which has been sort of the bedrock of EU internet regulation for the last two decades and which includes the broad safe harbors which have allowed the big US platforms to grow and to prosper. Um, unfettered, its criti critics would argue, by serious responsibilities. And this consultation heralds a really big, complex, emotive, multi-year lobby fight, which may, uh, may uh, end up being at least on par with the fight over the GDPR, which was adopted in 2016, and on the Copyright Directive, which was adopted last year. So um, although there is another piece of EU legislation pending, which is somewhat relevant to online advertising, which is called the e-privacy regulation, uh, I'm going to focus on the DSA because it's a much broader, uh, more ambitious project. Nothing less than the creation of a modern rulebook for digital services, as one of the uh, responsible commission members called it this morning. So the consultation launched today, it focuses on a number of issues and themes. Uh, illegal and harmful content, first of all, content, first of all. Uh, the Commission is looking for information on experiences with illegal content such as hate speech and counterfeit and with harmful but not illegal content such as disinformation and including information uh, about experiences with content moderation. Um, second big bucket is the responsibilities of platforms and other digital services. Uh, the Commission is, is asking for ideas on the extent of platforms responsibilities in relation to illegal and harmful content there's a ton of very detailed questions around different kinds of cooperation obligations for different kinds of uh, platforms in relation to different kinds of bad content. So um, notice and action fans uh, can see just about every possible variant discussed there. And that's going to be a big uh, avenue for sort of all sorts of stakeholders to, 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 to um, hand in their wish lists. Um, the third bit is uh, reviewing the safe harbor. Uh, the Commission wants to know how the current e-commerce directive liability framework is working and where upgrades are needed uh, for a number of digital players such as social media, search engines, online marketplaces, cloud storage providers, the kind of companies, services that weren't really sort of in vogue when this directive uh, was being negotiated in, in the late 90s. And there's some pretty important questions around whether the safe harbor for hosting services is sufficiently clear. Uh, quick hint, no it's not. Uh, and around sort of what we call the Good Samaritan problem, which is that platforms that moderate content risk disqualifying themselves from the safe harbor for being too active uh, and thus being liable for any content they keep up. 
CDA 230's approach to moderation, which is essentially to, to immunize platforms both for moderation and for non-moderation, is not part of the e-commerce directive. And removing what they call disincentives for voluntary action is, I think, a key part of the, um, of the Commission's thinking. Uh, perhaps the most radical issue, I suppose, is around uh, what they call gatekeeper platforms. Uh, there's a concerted push from a number of member states and stakeholders to create a new regime of sort of ex ante rules targeting particular large platforms. So communications law aficionados can uh, eat their hearts out. Uh, this is essentially mandating regulators to set and enforce specific rules for sp specific, uh, very big uh, platforms. The precise definition is really up in the air. Uh, systemic platforms, dominant platforms, platforms with significant network effects, platforms which play a gatekeeper role, those kinds of definitions are being fought over. Uh, the consultation asks companies to describe their issues with big platforms, so it's basically an open invitation to complain uh, and to get into the implications, definitions and parameters of things like market power, gatekeeper power, uh, and the, the sorts of platforms they're thinking about are app stores, online marketplaces, operating systems, search engines, those kinds of things. For now, they're sort of talking about quite specific issues such as uh, market entry problems, data portability, terms and conditions for business relations with platforms, but this really has the potential to become a lot bigger. Uh, European telecoms firms are just beginning to emerge from over two decades of very detailed ex ante regulation and there's actually quite significant potential for the EU to attempt something quite similar with uh, online platforms. Uh, there's a chapter in the consultation about emerging issues, other emerging issues, but that's almost entirely focused on uh, online advertising, both commercial and political. Uh, for the consultation, uh, from the consultation, it's pretty clear that the European Commission is pretty focused on all sorts of ad transparency issues, uh, the sale of counterfeit goods via the, via the internet and other sort of dangerous and unlawful goods. But the final question is, are there any other emerging issues in the space of online advertising you'd like to flag? So this could really go in a lot of uh, directions. Uh, finally, the, the gig economy platforms, uh, they're asking for input about ride hailing, food delivery, domestic work platforms, including on the terms and conditions set by companies, fees, allocation of liability, that kind of stuff, and potential health and safety uh, risks. Um, there's a question from Jeffrey around Jeffrey Kravitz around uh, for platforms outside the EU. How is that going to be? In, is there going to be any enforcement? Absolutely, yes. These things, these regulations are absolutely going to target all all companies which uh, target EU citizens, sell services in the EU. Um, that's that's definitely part of the plan, quite explicitly. Uh, you, there, there are some sort of discussions around the mechanics of how do you do that in practice, but as long as those companies have serious assets, serious offices, serious revenues in the EU, and are therefore susceptible to sort of pressure through politics, through media, through money, through employees, I think it's likely that regulators and, and legislators will find a way to make um, not just American, but also Chinese and other companies uh, uh, do, do, do some compliance. Uh, this is a public consultation that I'm talking about, um, but there are separate roadmap exercises. Um, so sorry, I should be clear. There's a public consultation which lasts for three months, uh, but there are separate roadmap exercises, as they call them, which one of which is about the responsibilities for digital services. And the other one is about this ex ante instrument, which I just talked about. Um, and they require input by the end of this month. Um, so companies doing online business in Europe should probably consider submitting a response. Uh, if the copyright fight is anything to go by, uh, sort of sitting out the debate or leaving it to broad industry groups is not going to be the best way to get heard. You should think about, you know, huge numbers of stakeholders arguing for stricter rules, more rules, and not that many people arguing for less rules or clearer rules or practical rules or rules which really effectively sort of balance free speech and practicality and other things. Um, we should see a formal proposal from the European Commission at the end of the year and then it's going to be sort of 12 to 24 months of mad fighting. Um, one a question is, do you expect litigation to play a major role in shaping these laws and if so, are there significant portions of these requirements that are especially vulnerable to legal challenge? Um, I'm going to get Later on, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the, the EU experience or, or thinking about sort of First Amendment type concerns. 
Um, but for now, I'll say that yes, um, this directive is going to be unclear when it's finished. The, direct, the, the definitions are going to be a mess. Um, the, the extent of the obligations is going to be unclear. So there is going to be litigation. Some of that is going to be sort of strategic litigation. There may, may be a member state which tries to get bits of the, the directive annulled. Uh, and after that, it's going to be waiting for cases to come up through the national courts, which then get referred to the uh, Court of Justice of the EU to sort of interpret bits of, uh, bits of directives. So that is unfortunately, you know, it's going to take sort of two, three years to get this thing on the statute book, then another couple of years to get it transposed into national law. And then it's going to take sort of five to 15 years to, to litigate it, to, to get some sense of what it means. And to be clear, there are still, there's still litigation about the e-commerce director from 20 years ago, filing its way through to the uh, CJU. So um, yeah, litigation is a part of our future. Uh, just to check if you're all still awake, um, I need to tell you the CLE affirmation code. That's AAEU12. I think that code is randomly generated, but the DSA is something of an all action EU 12 bore regulatory shotgun. So I hope that helps you remember it. Um, two more questions from one from Victoria. Um, some EU countries more aggressive here than others with their own laws. Can you talk about that tension? Who's the more aggressive here? Absolutely, this is part of the problem. So one of the reasons the European Commission is doing this um, is that there are, there's, there's a French law, there's a German law, and the European Commission wants to centralize this into a harmonized EU thing. And once that thing exists, um, you know, the countries will have to uh, implement that into their uh, national law. So one of the key goals of the European Commission is to get rid of these sort of divergent national approaches. But those national approaches will also be part of the of the haggling over the directive of the D, of the Digital Services Act. So uh, you know you'll see a lot of pulling in different directions there. Um, so in short, while the Commission's plans are not set in stone yet, I think the direction of travel is pretty clear. Um, as one of the roadmap documents puts it, the intention is to reinforce the internal market for digital services to lay down clearer, more stringent, harmonised rules for their responsibilities in order to increase citizen safety online and protect their fundamental rights while strengthening the effective functioning of the internal market to promote innovation, growth and competitiveness, particularly of European digital innovators, scale-ups, SMEs and new entrants. Wonderful text there. Um, and of course, whether you think you can do all those things at the same time uh, remains to be seen. Um, but I think it's useful. Uh, there's a, an article uh, um, from, from the MLRC journal, which is in the reading material, which, which I did on this with a colleague, which is useful to provide some kind of background. Of, you know, what is the EU trying to do more broadly around um, internet uh, regulation? Now, remember, uh, this is just the Commission's thinking. You have 27 member states. You have the European Parliament, hundreds of stakeholders. They're all going to be pulling this in all sorts of directions. Uh, just to give you a prominent example, the French government's already come out with its two priorities which they call one, an economic ex-ante regulation of structuring digital platforms to tackle problems deriving from their exorbitant market power. That gives you some flavor. And secondly, to strengthen at EU level the responsibility of platforms, given the significant risks users face with regards to access to illegal and dangerous content and products. So I think if you look at that second thing, uh, second priority, you see there is quite a lot of talk about um, you know, the idea of imposing sort of overarching duties of care, responsibilities. Um, you know, the Commission's talking about harmonizing sort of specific binding and proportionate obligations, specifying the different responsibilities in particular for ad online platform services. And, you know, you could argue that that notion of general responsibilities or duties or obligations is already implicit in some CJU case law and some national case law. Um, and, it's been formally proposed by the UK as well. And it sounds kind of reasonable to focus on a platform's overall approach to preventing harm rather than sort of each individual content moderation decision. But putting that into practice gets really messy really quickly. Um, and readers of Daphne Keller's recent blog post on that idea will understand what I mean. And I think we'll start getting a glimpse of how messy that does get this autumn. Uh, when video platforms and regulators start grappling with the, the appropriate measure standard under the revised AVMS directive. You know, if the, if the DSA ends up making a platform's right to invoke the safe harbor conditional on meeting some kind of systemic duty of care, uh, that would incentivize them to block risky content more broadly. 
and still leave them open to additional injunctions in specific cases. I think um, Alan Dickerson made a similar point in the previous panel about the sort of the quantum of content that ends up getting blocked, and that's going to be more rather than less. Uh, so is it all uh, bad news for US platforms? Uh, mostly yes, at least if you consider more regulation to be bad news. Although to be fair, some platforms actually have been uh, increasingly arguing for more rules, particularly in the sphere of content moderations. One uh, potential upside of the Commission's plan is that they want to do away with all the various national laws, as, as I just discussed, and replace it with a single rule book. Um, it also wants to strengthen the country of origin principle, meaning that you only have to deal with one regulator. Uh, so if you like life under the Irish regulator, you might want more of that. And finally, the European Commission promises to increase legal certainty, which of course would be a good thing, uh, but as uh, as Mike Tyson might have said, if he'd been an EU platform regulation lawyer, um, everyone plans for their legislative proposal to increase legal certainty until they get punched in the mouth by Brussels compromise uh, politics. Uh, one quick question from uh, Nancy, uh, if I can repeat the code, yes, of course. Um, the Sealy affirmation code is AAEU12, AAEU12, one, two at the end. Um, I want to end with some remarks on the oddities uh, of EU rulemaking, which may be useful going forward. Uh, and first of all, on the overall European approach to freedom of expression, which is, after all, the main topic of today's uh, conference. Uh, from a distance, um, the debate in the US about internet policy often seems almost paralyzed by whether a particular measure would be compatible with the uh, First Amendment. Uh, the pre-lunch panel had something of that as well. And I think a thing to bear in mind is that that kind of spectre does not hang over the EU policy debate. Um, everyone recognizes that freedom of expression is fundamental and important, uh, but there's also a broad recognition that it's not absolute uh, and that it should be balanced with other fundamental interests. Uh, the idea of fair balance takes some getting used to if you come from a place where freedom of expression outweighs sort of all other fundamental rights. Uh, although a European jester might note that free speech beats off a privacy claim pretty easily in the US, that can appear to wither quite quickly uh, before a copyright claim. Um, this willingness in Europe to limit freedom of expression, uh, for example, to protect privacy interests, has regularly caused First Amendment lawyers to sort of wax lyrical to me about why their ancestors got on the Mayflower. But whatever your views on the European approach, it's helpful to bear in mind when considering EU policy or when interacting with EU policy people, because I've seen sort of the First Amendment being a real source of US-EU misunderstanding in tech policy. EU politicians tell each other sort of weary jokes about um, US tech companies who come to lobby them and they complain that, you know, the Americans complain that some legislative initiative is bad because it violates the First Amendment. And the sort of the generally unspoken uh, but pretty visceral response on the behalf of these European policymakers as well. Actually, the, Euro, you know, the, the First Amendment is your problem, it's not ours. So I think it's helpful to sort of bear in mind very bluntly, uh, Europe does not care about the First Amendment. It does care about freedom of expression, uh, but not as absolutely as a trainer, as a lawyer trained in the First Amendment might expect uh, or uh, want. Uh, finally, um, a little bit about uh, EU rulemaking. Uh, which from a US perspective can be very, very perplexing at the best of times. And I completely commiserate. You know, you have an unfamiliar range of legal instruments such as regulations and directives and guidelines uh, with quite different functions and effects. And sometimes they don't even tell you which instrument they're thinking of. So the Digital Services Act is called an act, even though the EU doesn't actually have an act because they still haven't made up their mind whether they want to make it a directive or whether they can get away with making it a regulation. Uh, you have a sort of bewildering cast of elected and unelected politicians, uh, many of them with presidents in their job title. And you know, if you think one president expressing an opinion about platform regulation is trouble, uh, then Europe, Europe's gonna give you nightmares. Uh, you have this sort of Byzantine uh, legislative process that makes you, the US Congress look streamlined and rational and transparent. Think uh, amendment exchange followed by conference committee, but then with three institutions, not two, and with 27 national governments and parliaments and stakeholders, uh, beating down their neck. Um, and of course, then once a, a law has actually been adopted, uh, the realization that nothing has actually changed 
um, and that um, 27 separate EU member states still have to implement this thing into the national law. There's generally around two years between the adoption of an EU measure and its actual application at the member state level. Um, as I described, uh, you know, we're in that sort of weird in-between stage for a range of important rules. Um, there's a difficult legal question around all the obvious permutations. So you have member states which transpose too soon, too late, too little, too much, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, even when the rules have been transposed into national law, it turns out that national legislators and courts don't actually have anything to say or any right to say what those EU rules mean, which means, as we discussed just now, that you have to sort of wait several more years until cases work their way through the national courts and then onto the CJU. And to be quite honest, the decision of the CJU can be, shall we say, challenging to interpret. And those complexities are magnified in the context of EU rulemaking in the digital sphere. You know, there's a high media and political interest. Uh, the competing interests at stake are, are, are massive. The lobbying is massive, and it's also really vicious. And that can be expected to beget a pretty unfathomable compromise of sort of wordy recitals and Delphic contradictory provisions. And it then falls to the EU Court of Justice to interpret, you know, make sense of, try to figure out what these rules mean. One question at a time, we're completely dependent on the randomness of which questions get passed to the CJU by which countries members, uh, uh, by which countries judges, based on which facts and which parties. Um, so we get to sort of learn what this means, one random question at a time. The CJU can't pick its cases, you know, there's no, no sort of certiorari type process. They have hundreds of cases a year, they're totally overworked, uh, and they're meant to give you general EU law interpretations, but they often as not end up telling you who should win the case, which, depending on which case gets up to the CJU, can give you a very good or a very bad outcome. Um, but the real fault lies with the legislator, which comes up with really, you know, bad compromised texts. You can sort of, you know, they say a camel is a, is a horse designed by committee, and you know, that's always been pretty unfair to camels. Uh, but by the standard of recent EU legislation, camels are particularly beautiful, uh, intelligible, and practical creatures. And I think for the Digital Services Act, we're probably going to need another metaphor. Uh, the EU legislative system is very far from perfect, as, I'm, as I think you will have gotten from my presentation. Um, and if anything, one of its faults is that its default set to produce legislation, even if it has very far-reaching effects, and even if those effects haven't really been fully thought through. There are really you know, dozens of digital initiatives of various kinds percolating through the Brussels legislative machinery, consultations, communications, dialogues, directives, guide, you know, all sorts of stuff. And not all of that will get onto the statute book, uh, but a serious number of them will. So I think my message to you today is sort of buckle up, we're in for quite a ride. Um, that is the end of what I wanted to say. Um, Let's see if there are any other questions which I didn't get around to. Um, Valentina has a question. Uh, in one of its communications, the European Commission actually introduced the Good Samaritan protection by saying that platforms cannot be held liable for illegal content when they moderate content proactively. So, do you think that's a sufficient safeguard against overcompliance? Um, no, because the European Commission can say whatever it wants, uh, but it doesn't actually get to determine EU law. Um, it's, it was a very helpful and very you know, sought after confirmation by the European Commission that if you do uh, content moderation, that doesn't make you liable for whatever content you leave up. But that's just the opinion of the European Commission um, and the, the, the CJU and national courts are not bound by the European Commission's opinion. So you will still find, and you do find in fact, and I regularly find in courts, uh, claimants saying that that's random and that the fact that the big platforms do lots of content moderation means that they are too active to invoke the safe harbor and that they are liable for um, uh, for whatever they keep up. Uh, you know, you have, uh, there, 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 we've had three decisions from the same district court uh, in Amsterdam about uh, ad platform, uh, about ads on, on Facebook's ad service, sort of fairly contradictory. The first two said that Facebook uh, can't invoke the safe harbor for its ad service because it does a lot of filtering and and and, and the content moderation and policy enforcement and therefore it's liable uh, and therefore it has to filter lots of uh, you know repeat infringements and then the third one 
which came out just a couple of weeks ago, said, no, actually, um, Facebook does more than enough to combat bad ads on its platform. Those were about celeb bait ads and that there's no, no need to enforce, uh, to, to apply further measures. So you really see uh, national courts fight, you know, fighting with this, grappling with not just the, the technology and the politics of, of this kind of filtering and, and content moderation, but also with the law. You know, does the fact that these platforms have policies in place, and all the big ones do, you know, everyone's moderating to some extent, does that mean that they, they have stopped being passive hosts and become liable, um, or can they, because that obviously would be very perverse to, you know, to punish them for, for what they do and to incentivize them to do less. So this is a real challenge in the EU at the moment. Uh, it's a challenge that the, that the Commission understands and which may or may not be addressed in the Digital Services Act. So check back again in, uh, in four years' time. And in the meantime, good luck. I think I'm at the end of my uh, 45 minutes, so I'll pass the virtual baton uh, back to Sandy. And thank you all very much for your attention and your questions. I hope it's been of some use. That was an amazing run through, Remy. Thank you so much. Um, I find this all fascinating. Anyone who's known me for any length of time knows that my concerns about the EU policies are having an impact on how we think and how we have to operate it goes way back, um, way, way back. And I find I've rarely been wrong and um, find presentations like Remy's very, very useful. For, for all of us, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, again, we're gonna take a short break and you will see shortly the next panel come up live. Um, the next panel is on where algorithms meet the First Amendment and we'll have a, a, a hard uh, start at um, 1.30. So see you in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>